What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Man here. Welcome back to the channel. It's time for another, uh, you know, more personal, leaning back, talking to the camera, face to face kind of video. Been a long time, really, isn't it? Right. And uh, the uh, the motivation for this came through a documentary that I watched recently, the Light documentary, which was recommended by a couple of people. Uh, to me to watch because um, you know I've talked about the subjects that are dealt with in this documentary myself quite a lot in the past you know one meal a day weight loss how important it is to be light for climbing performance and all this kind of stuff and they are dealing with this kind of stuff in this documentary as well so I thought you know what I'll give it a watch and uh, maybe we can make a nice little review of that um, in a sort of say uh, yeah commenting a little bit on what is uh, mentioned in this documentary and how they present the subject and everything. Uh, so I hope it's going to be interesting for to some of you. I'm sorry that um, this is probably going to be a little bit rambly. I could probably talk a little bit shorter about what I am talking about in the next couple of maybe 30 minutes or something. Maybe I'm going to put up timestamps or something if there's a significant chapters. And I've also written down here a couple of notes so that I hopefully don't forget anything and stay a little bit more on track, you know. But um, yeah, I try to keep it as one take as possible. Maybe we also have the one or the other cut in there. So let's start out with the positives right away that uh, I can mention here. A lot, a lot of kudos I want to give to, um, you know, the people talking about this very touchy subject because it's not very often talked about in the climbing community, although, <laughs> obwohl, which is the German although, Although it is such a huge, hugely important and, uh, you know, often used, often applied topic, uh, people are losing weight for top performance all the time in climbing. And why is that? Because it is such an effective strategy. Yeah. So, of course, this can go down the wrong path. And this has been talked about in the documentary uh, when it's becoming dangerous with eating disorders and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people, a lot of uh, especially high end limit people actually are struggling with this kind of subject. And lots of kudos for talking up, uh, up about this because it's kind of a it's kind of like, um, you know, doping in uh, other sports you know everybody knows kind of what's up everybody knows ah, okay they are probably on gear this and that but nobody likes to talk about that right because it shines a not so bright light on this kind of sport in that case and i think that the same thing is true with uh, you know restricting calories going on diets and everything with climbing so kudos for talking up about that stuff another positive that i want to mention and this is actually interesting because most people would regard this rather as a negative, I think. But I want to give kudos for the very female-leaning perspective that they had in this documentary. They interviewed a lot of girls. I think one guy was there as well, this Kai, Kai Leitner guy, or what was his name? Uh, but apart from that, there is a lot of female uh, commentary, a lot of female interviews. And you could say now, of course, ah, this is very biased. This is, uh, you know, sexist or whatever. But um, I, for me personally, I think this is actually a good thing because I think that females are more affected. This is just the, uh, the reality that I see, at least, that the females are more affected by this kind of subject. And I mean not necessarily that more females go down this route of starving themselves and becoming light for performance. In fact, I would rather argue that uh, more males, because they have more... Um, you know, air guides, they want more glory, okay, they want more good results, they want it just more uh, and more often. Uh, they go down that route actually more often, but the thing is that they don't suffer as much from going down that route compared to uh, female athletes, okay, and what do I mean with that? Uh, like, let's talk fertility, for example, which is actually something that I bring up later as well, but with regards to fertility, uh, starvation and calorie restriction and all this kind of stuff in a female body is much more unhealthy than in a male body. Uh, you can see this by, you know, period becoming unregular, period disappearing completely, uh, you know, becoming essentially too lean to produce these sexual hormones to stay fertile and all this kind of stuff. And I think that this is all very, very important actually for the female body, and for the male body as well. Yeah, it's not good for the male body if the sex drive goes down the, the trash, so to say, all the way. Um, but the truth is that uh, males for example they they have a much larger much longer reproductive window right 
So even if they go completely uh, monk mode during their <laughs> during their 20s, 30s to achieve maximum athletic gains, so to speak, they can still procreate in their 40s, in their 50s, yeah, when their athletic career is long over. The same is not true, unfortunately, for females. Yeah, if they trash their reproductive window, it's gonna be it's gonna have a much much bigger effect on their overall life outcome. Uh, compared to males and this is why I think that the whole starvation and athletic performance thing is much more tricky and dangerous for females actually because it can affect their life much more to the negative compared to males although they may not so often run into this problem not not there is just not many not so many crazy aggressive you know competitive females out there although there are nowadays yeah uh, I don't want to disregard that but um uh, I think that more males in terms of quantity go down this p problematic route of starvation but uh, females are much more endangered by going down that route and that's why I think that the female perspective that was given in this documentary is actually a good thing okay it, it highlights the, the the you know the problematicness so to speak with the female body a little bit more than compared to the males so this is what I have to say about the kudos here essentially yeah let's move on to the critiques um so, and this is also the first critique that I really have with this film, is uh, there is no mention of fertility, you know, with females in this kind of subject. Fertility is really the number one thing that uh, should be highlighted here in terms of, you know, what is actually unhealthy. Uh, this is another critique that I have with the, I have with the film, <clears throat> that um, there was a lot mentioned about calorie restriction, you know, there was quotes like, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I skipped that meal because I wanted to try this project tomorrow or I, I had to skip a meal because I wanted to do this competition. I mean, this kind of behavior, of course, is problematic, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have an eating disorder. Yeah? Maybe you're just a little bit, uh, hopefully you are, yeah? you are very aware of the conditioning advantages that this behavior is going to give you. And in this case, it's actually quite smart to do that because you um, you will have a, quite a significant edge over all those athletes that don't do this kind of conditioning. Yeah? Because as I said, uh, being light and uh, strong at the same time is what is where it's at with climbing performance. Yeah, but what I want to say is I kind of lacked this uh, clear definition of when a certain eating behavior becomes problematic. If you know what I mean, what is what is the anorexic thing? What is the bulimic thing? Uh, where do we draw the line here? You know, a 48-hour fast here and there is not problematic in my opinion. Again, in my opinion, this is rather a smart thing, a smart weapon to have in your pocket, so to speak, if you, you know, if you find this project outdoors and you just get close enough to tick it off, but you need to lose those last three to four to five kilograms or something to tick it off finally, well, I think I'd argue this is rather smarter than staying at your high weight and banging out attempts after attempts after attempts for 30 days and on. Uh, and instead of sending it, you kind of get depressed over it. You're ruining your body. Maybe you're also injuring your body. This is also something that happens very often when you try something at a very heavy state very often. Yeah? You always have the same moves, the same stresses in your body. This is very injury prone. So I would rather argue that here and there a fast to achieve those um, high-end you know, conditioning stages where you're really light and very strong at the same time and then tick that project off quite quickly and then coming back, bouncing back relatively quickly to your normal weight again, this is not a problematic thing in my opinion. Yeah, so I feel that in this documentary they threw all these kind of strategies under, you know, uh, under the bus, so to speak, out of the bath water and uh, called it all problematic i would say it would have been better to give uh, here more clear more direct um you know definitions of what is really an eating disorder so that people out there watching the documentary can actually identify their own behavior as problematic or non-problematic for that matter again uh, the, the, the regular 24 hour or 48 hour fast to achieve maximum condi conditioning or something I would not argue that this is something problematic I've done this myself a lot in the past it is super effective that is just the reality so um, yeah where do we draw the line here yeah? so this is something that I wanted to mention 
yeah, are we going to look at BMI? Uh, in this case, what's a healthy BMI? What's not? That's very debatable. Yeah? There's people who have naturally a much lower BMI than other people. We're going to talk about that in a second as well. All right, so Mona was just uh, adding something which could be important as well. And that for the from the female perspective, because I was talking a lot about where do we draw the line, right? What is actually uh, an eating disorder? And for her, she said that um, a lot of these girls, you know, they start out on this uh, journey, on this weight loss journey to become better at climbing and everything. But uh, at some point that goes into their head somehow and they uh, stand in front of a mirror and they get this psychological issue that they look into the mirror and they feel like a chubby, th more thick girl, you know. And they just hate that and that makes them dis depressed and everything and then they want to get leaner and leaner and although they are already super lean they still see that chubby girl in the mirror right and uh yeah that's how a lot of these girls seem to go down that route yeah that's what uh, mona wanted to add because she said um you know if i analyze this kind of stuff with my super rational uh, thinking and everything a lot of uh, people who watch this might not feel understood you know what in terms of what's an, an eating disorder but i don't know i had the feeling that uh, also the documentary it really didn't go so much into this kind of stuff it, it was much more like um people wanted to be light to perform on the wall a lot better right uh so yeah that's just a little uh, addition from mona here thanks for that yeah, people talked a lot about, I did eat less food. I, you know, I skipped a meal, a lot of, you know, less quantity of food. What is not talked about at all, and which probably I would rather argue, maybe this could be even, this could have an even higher impact than food quantity nowadays on the athletic population, is the food quality. Yeah. So what are they actually eating if they eat something? <laughs> yeah, this, this is also something that's very important because... I myself, as you know, I have a quite long experience with uh, high carb vegan diets, for example, and I can tell you, you can eat calories left, right, and center on a high on a high vegan diet, <laughs> high carb vegan diet, and uh, if you train at the same time and you perform very hard at the same time, then this diet is gonna shred you down like crazy. It's gonna lean you out, and the same thing happens, of course, with female uh, athletes which are even proner, even more, um, you know, leaning towards this kind of vegan lifestyle because they have more, um, you know, more empathy, more emotionality with, with foods a little bit, you know, they want to protect the animals and stuff like that. So the truth is that just, uh, you know, uh, female athletes, females in general tend to lean more towards a vegetarian, -ness -nesque, vet vegan veganish kind of lifestyle okay and this is also very prevalent in the climbing community very prevalent amongst all sports where being light is an advantage yeah so i was also thinking oh this is amazing i can i can uh, i can slap all those flies with one clap essentially i'm gonna be super healthy because i skip all the animal products i'm gonna be super light for my climbing the 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 truth is or this is just my opinion now after going through all of these experiences that um it is not the healthiest way yeah you're gonna starve yourself although you're eating all of these calories this is an important point because as again as i said again yeah where do we draw the line here what's really an eating disorder would you say that eating five times a day is super high calorie rice and vegetables is an eating disorder probably not obviously this person is eating a lot of calories right but it's also important that the quality of these calories is on, is on point and that means that you get your animal products in sometimes it means that you get your healthy fats your fat soluble vitamins and all that kind of stuff essentially the stuff that you can almost only get from animal products that you get this kind of stuff in as well uh, i just wanted to mention that because it's not always food quantity that is the thing yeah food quality plays a huge role again uh, there as well and you can eat a lot and still shred out like crazy and get the anorexic look so to speak yeah although you eat more um and then what i wanted to also mention in uh, the critique so to speak is there wasn't really or I was lacking a bit the discussion about real world solutions to this kind of problem. Yeah, let's call it a problem here. But um, really, what are the real world solutions to this? Because the fact of the matter is that uh, being light in climbing is just a huge advantage. It just works. OK, this is the reality. Uh, 
you can argue as much as you want. Uh, there was a, a saying in the video where people said, you know what, it's actually better. It feels better to be heavy and strong uh, than being, you know, light and weak. But the truth is that even if you're lighter, if you never, even if you're a little bit weaker in your light stage, there is a high chance that you're actually going to be stronger in your light stage. Yeah? Uh, for me, for example, let's say now I'm at 68 kilograms, which puts me at the BMI of a whopping 23, by the way. Uh, we're going to look, we're going to take a look at the BMI list in a second. That's going to be interesting. But if I would uh, lose, let's say, for example, uh, five, six kilograms, yeah, a tenth of almost a tenth of my body weight, 10% of my body weight, uh, I would not lose 10% of my finger strength. Yeah? Th that would just not happen. Maybe I'd lose one, two percent if, if, if uh, something at all. Yeah? In my experiments, in my conditioning experiments, I did not uh, notice any detrimental effects on finger strength whatsoever. I just got a lot lighter and I got an incredible performance boost because imagine that you're 10% lighter, but you still have almost the same finger strength and the same general strength in your body. That's just amazing and this stuff just works. You, you just need to take a look at the Mission 8B series that I've filmed in the past, for example. Yeah, I drive fast at there for two days dropped uh, like five kilos or something because I knew I had a, ni a nice uh, outdoor day upcoming, the upcoming weekend. And then I ticked off this 8B boulder. Yeah, was my all time personal best bouldering performance. So this stuff just works. Yeah, this is the, this is the, the problem, <laughs> if so to speak, if you, if you will. Um, because yeah, then what is, what's the real world solution with that? W solutions with that obviously is also, also working in the, in the competition scene. Yeah. If you take a look at the guys that are out there and uh, and uh, performing, I mean, they they look super lean and they think about these kind of things as well. Yeah, otherwise they wouldn't be competing at such a high level. Um, so what are the solutions? Maybe we could say. Um, I think one thing was mentioned where uh, I would have. Uh, people should go up uh, to to these athletes, right? People should walk up to these athletes and tell them, hey, you know what, you you don't look healthy anymore. You should be careful, da 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 da, and that's the solution or something. Yeah, I mean, okay, so you wanna so you wanna go up to every climber now, every high level climber, and tell them, you know what, they they don't look healthy. You have a problem. You should maybe address this. You wanna walk up to every marathoner, you know, every every. Uh, you want to walk up to every ski jumper you know, or you want to walk up to every strong man out there who carries like 250 pounds or something and tell them you know what maybe it's not a good idea to take all this gear maybe you should uh, yeah lose some weight and because carrying all this weight on your bones and joints it's gonna ruin your uh, it's gonna ruin you later on the reality is, and this is talked about in the documentary as well, that uh, most of these people know that their behavior is probably not the healthiest. Yeah, the matter of fact is, if you want to achieve uh, limit athletic performance in any way, shape, or form, you gotta sacrifice health. This is something that I've talked about in the past as well. Yeah, what is still healthy? Where do we draw the line here? What's and in, in my personal opinion, the, the amount of exercise and the amount of sports that is still in a healthy realm is surprisingly low, yeah? surprisingly little. Maybe one hour of walking per day or something. Yeah? And everything beyond that is actually stress on the body. It costs you calories, it costs you cell divisions because you, uh, you're impacting your muscle tissue, your tendons, and this stuff has to be regenerated. Then you have to eat more food again, you have to take more calories in to repair that damage, all costing you uh, metabolism, costing you lifetime, costing you a little bit of health in the end. Yeah? So um, yeah, the amount of exercise that is still healthy is surprisingly low in my opinion. And all of these high-end athletes, they much more likely know what's up, yeah, better than you uh, who wants to walk up to them and tell them they look unhealthy. They know what's up them, themselves as well. Yeah? They know that if they want to have these uh, limit performances, they have to sacrifice health for that. And the truth is also that a lot of people would sacrifice a lot of health probably for fame and glory. Yeah, this is just how it is. And if you can achieve that through these means by, you know, winning competitions or doing that first 9C or whatever. Yeah. And I will go down that route. I mean, I wouldn't, I would probably not be any different. I don't have the, um, the 
perfect genetic foundations for this kind of stuff yeah because let's face it also there's people who deal with a very low bmi a lot better than other people yeah and this is something that uh, you know genetically speaking uh, and this is something that i wanted to highlight with this bmi list uh, i mean i have no idea <laughs> most top climbers reach a healthy bmi this was an article on 88.nu some time ago nando zanchetta has searched the internet for the weight and length for some of the top athletes in order to measure the bmi i have no freaking idea how i ever made it on that list but i'm on this list as well uh, with 172 centimeters and 63 kilograms so this was at a, re a relatively light stage of mine yeah probably back in the high carb vegan days reaching a bmi of 21.3 well nowadays i'm 68 kilograms yeah uh, beyond past my vegan experiment is over as i've talked about a number of times in the past now i'm 68 kilograms which puts me at 23 bmi yeah so let's take a look at some of the some of the bangers in here i mean have you seen Sachi Ama? Sachi Ama, what the hell? 173 centimeters, 52 kilograms. 52 kilograms, I mean, this is 16 kilograms lighter than I am now. I mean, I look, I can show you my gut here real quickly. It's shredded, okay? It's still shredded. <laughs> So it's not like I have 15% um, body fat or something. At the moment, I'm, I'm probably at around 10% body fat or something. And again, all of these concrete numbers, right? BMIs, body fat percentages, it's not mentioned in the documentary at all. All of these concrete, they have this doctor there, um, you know, talking about eating disorders and stuff like that, but never getting really concrete on what's the, what is actually an eating disorder? What's an unhealthy body composition for a male and a female? You know, all these things that you could use to orient yourself, whether you, whether your, your behavior is problematic or not, right? Wasn't mentioned in the documentary. It was rather a lot of emotional pandering and stuff like that. I'm going to get into that as well. But, um, yeah, just to highlight this, um, what's up with Sachiyama? What's up with uh, where 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 did he be? Chong Won Chon, what the hell? One hundred and seventy six centimeters with fifty three kilograms. That's freaking crazy. Fifteen kilograms lighter than I am. Same he same height. Even maybe a little bit taller. Yeah, definitely m more reach. <laughs> yeah. So that's crazy. That's what we're talking about here. I mean, if I imagine myself fifteen kilograms lighter, I'm I'm flying, baby. I'm flying. So it's it's crazy. Of course, this uh, doesn't mean that Chong Won Chon is unhealthy or anything. It just means that uh, maybe he's able to deal with this low BMI a lot better, genetically speaking, than I do. I'm pretty sure if I would be 52 kilograms, I would struggle, man. I pff, wouldn't be a fun life anymore. Yeah, I just like being at 68 kilograms too much. So yeah, and still, as you can see, I'm already shredded. Yeah, so maybe it's the heavy bones. I don't know what it is. Yeah, but. Uh, uh, you can some people can be a lot leaner and a lot lower BMI than others and this is uh, only genetics yeah this makes only sense I was also researching whether there is actually some sort of BMI restrictions or some sort of BMI limits when it comes to climbing competitions and I found this interesting gray area there where uh, a red card which means essentially a disqualification I think is issued if um, the athlete disagrees with a BMI measurement that is directed by the head of the jury, yeah, which is interesting because apparently there is no limit BMI. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I really tried to find it. Correct me if I'm wrong uh, down below. I really tried to find it in the IFSC regulations, but I couldn't really find it. Uh, this would, of course, be one tool to, um, you know, be able to select out those athletes who pushed it too far, yeah? like making a BMI limit of, let's say, 17 or 18 or something like that. But then again, a lot of people are just healthy at that kind of BMI or could potentially be healthy at that kind of BMI. Yeah? Who knows? Where do we draw the line here? It's a tricky thing. Um, so it's kind of a gray area with climbing competitions, really, I think. Yeah, as long as somebody looks healthy and seems to perform well for the head of the jury, they can compete. Yeah? And that can mean everything. It also can be that the head of the jury has an eating disorder <laughs> and just lets all these anorexic people compete. Yeah. So this is also a thing that, um, yeah, it's kind of a gray area, really. Uh, I think that in the end, 
it will be treated like in any other uh, weight dependent sports but without weight classes yeah we don't have any weight classes or bmi classes or anything like that in climbing i think that is a uh, rather a good thing yeah it um, also is a lot of a challenge for the setters for the problem setters to create problems that suit every climber equally it's hard like that but yet again then this is the reason why we often see very varying uh, results in climbing competitions yeah because some competitions luckily just suit some climber a lot better than others yeah we see this with reach and height not only with uh, with weight and stuff yeah uh the responsibility the, the responsibility will stay at the athlete and this is also where i think it belongs yeah they should educate themselves to be able to estimate the price the price they have to pay when they want those limit results those limit um, you know when they want the victory in these competitions or when they want to send this 9c or whatever yeah they have to go down this conditioning route and the responsibility is uh, is at them essentially yeah to educate themselves and see what uh, what kind of effects this can have on the body uh you could go from there and say well then why not just lift all doping regulations as well for all sorts of sports keep that responsibility to the athletes completely as well and you would be surprised in a lot of these very big very uh, you know high profile sports there's actually a huge crowd advocating for just that lifting all these doping regulations because it would put an end to this endless arm race between developing new new doping methods uh, versus you know developing new doping testing yeah they have this constant arm race i mean if we're honest with each other on this high end sports we know that a lot, a lot of these people are on gear yeah it's just they are trying to you know bypass the testing and thereby get their results yeah so why is that why did we not yet have the regulation lift of uh, doping and i think this is because this with these high profile high money making sports uh, they have a large audience yeah and this audience likes to believe that these athletes are natural they are just naturally fit they trained all their life and that's how they get these results and these are idols right these are idols to look up for for their kids and everything you don't want to have an idol idol that's that's shooting gear left right and center right officially it's not a cool thing to have yeah you want to have this uh this illusion of the natural athlete so to speak that's why they still have these doping regulations of, although everybody knows that people constantly try to bypass them with new doping methods and everything yeah will climbing go down the same route if it becomes more popular and becomes more profitable <sighs> is to be questioned yeah maybe maybe i hope it's rather not the case but uh, we will see how it ends up in the end again with these with this bmi weight thing we already have something like that yeah uh, people are starving themselves people are probably damaging their bodies to get in that high condition state already uh, so yeah it's really hmm gonna be interesting what what are the real world solutions yeah and and this was not discussed in any concrete manner i have the feeling during the documentary that's why it's a critique point here and it also leads me to another critique point why not just invite a complete high-end level pro and let him talk about this subject or her yeah I mean, imagine an, an interview of Adam Ondra or Alex Magos uh, during this interview, talk, uh, during this documentary, talking about this kind of subject. How interesting would that be? Because I'm pretty sure that these guys also are aware of this kind of conditioning. Yeah, skipping a meal or two, you know, dropping the calories a little bit to get lighter, to send the freaking project. I mean, if you already have spent years, like Adam Ondra, for example, days, years, uh, countless attempts on end for certain projects i mean do you think that they would not make use of a super simple and super effective method like this uh to you know push their chances to chances to finally get it done of course they do of course they do and it would just be interesting to hear from a real pro perspective uh how this goes you know when it's becoming dangerous do they think about this kind of stuff when do they have to stop with this kind of conditioning yeah that would be super super interesting and i was kind of lacking this from the documentary as well uh, it's obviously there's another point is very emotional yeah it's, it's a lot like this yeah and uh it's very 
it was very intense and but i knew i had to get the project done and, and then they're looking into this they have this you know <laughs> this kind of documentary interview look all the time which i get okay you need to have some sort of uh emotionality to keep the audience attent uh, attention and uh, uh you know convey the story in a nice and uh, uh, entertaining way and stuff but I kind of miss the times when documentaries were really just an objective look at a certain topic, right? I mean, I don't know whenever that uh, that changed, but um, and that's what I would like about a documentary is that it's super objective, that there's a lot of data to look at, a lot of, um, you know, real world uh, things that you can compare so that you can orient yourself what's actually up, yeah. All right, and I think thereby we are already at the final statements um, that I wanted to pick out. I wanted to pick out three final statements that I found in the documentary, which were rather where I had the impression it's rather <laughs> the opposite is the truth. Yeah, uh, being heavy and strong is better than light and weak. I've talked about this in the review a little bit already, but uh, you can lose a lot of weight without losing significant amounts of strength. Yeah. At least that's my experience and this is very again this means that this this method is super effective yeah? and the thing at the beginning of the documentary they say oh it's there's nothing there is nothing better than feeling light on the wall and just cruising up the climbs and everything and then later they say it's better to being actually strong and heavy than feeling light uh, I think that is rather the, the first is the truth. Yeah, it's just being light, feeling light, and feeling strong as, as as well at the same time on the wall is just unbeaten. Yeah, I, I I think that this is the case for me as well. It's a good, it's cool to say that, but the truth is, um, being light is the thing. Then there is another thing. This is not the way forward. Yes, it is, unfortunately. Yeah? If you want to have those limit results, if you want to climb that 9C, if you want to climb that first female 9B, you think these people do not go through these processes? Of course they do. Yeah, This is the way forward. You Climbing was and always will be about being as strong and light at the same time as possible. And then you may uh, multiply that by reach or whatnot. Yeah? But yeah, finger strength divided by body weight. Yeah, What I've been saying count meant countless times already this is how it works so this is how these limit results are produced and then finally at the end of the uh documentary they say so when are we finally over it is i feel like i'm still not recovered and that's the, that's the you know some of these uh girls they interviewed they said that and that's the ironic thing i think uh for old school people you know just super health oriented fertility oriented old school grandmas looking at these girls they still not look healthy to them yeah they still are at a very low body weight for their age and and, and their reproductive uh, age that they are in at the moment yeah they, a lot of people still would not argue that that's healthy so um they still work with this effect yeah they still work with it just at a much uh at a much lower level now or at a relatively speaking lower level i like how this one girl said that um she wants to climb el cap in a day now and that's why she has to eat more because uh, otherwise she's lacking the resources to do that this is actually really true uh if you're becoming a lot lighter and uh you don't sacrifice so much in terms of raw finger strength or you know max strength but you sacrifice in terms of volume output you just can't go your six seven attempts then anymore you can only go two three attempts but that's that but that's enough to get this one single pitch sport route done right it's just um, yeah now we moved from uh you know the old school grandma to this kind of subject again but that's another interesting point actually you sacrifice volume instead of max output and of course in the modern climbing community where sport climbing and bouldering is where it's at for most people uh, performance does not suffer a lot from being a lot lighter yeah again the l cap in a day this suffers of course from having not the resources inside of your body stored uh, to be able to do such a thing and i like how this one girl pointed that out yeah this is actually a good point but anyway, uh, still these girls are working with this effect just at a lower level and the old school grannies would still say they look unhealthy for them. Yeah? And this, again, it puts the high the high performance female athlete into perspective in general. Yeah, This is in general, I think, a questionable 
thing. Uh, again, females suffer from these consequences a lot more because of their much, much shorter and much smaller reproductive window, yeah? So yeah, I think... Uh, and yeah, to, to give, a, to give a, just a very... Just to give a very general uh, thing for orientation for female athletes in case there is one or two girls watching this video actually because my audience is I think 85% male. But anyway, if you're watching this video and you're a female, uh, again, be aware what Mona said is a psychological thing, okay? If you have the feeling at, at some point that uh, you look in the mirror and you still see a, a chubby girl, although you're super shredded and lean already, then you know you have a little bit of a problem there. And uh, maybe you should, uh, you know, seek out psychological help or anything. And what I want to add to that is a very, very simple and easy to measure um, way of health, you know, to measuring a healthy female, so to speak, to measure health in a female, which is in who is in their reproductive window, is do you get your period regularly, okay? This is something that goes out of the window a lot, lot sooner than even being very thin or being very light or anything, yeah, which is all kind of arbitrary. We don't know where to draw the line here. Get, do you get your period every 28 days, every 30 days or something like that? This is just a very, very reliable and very easy to measure health marker for females. And once that goes out of the window, which is surprisingly early, and again, it also has to do with food quality, not only with food quantity, if that goes out the window, you know something's off, yeah? Would be cool if they had mentioned that in the documentary as well, but they didn't do it. Yeah, this is uh, unfortunate, I think, a little bit. But yeah, uh, that's uh, all I have to say, I think, for the, uh, for the review of the light documentary. Kudos for um, talking about such a touchy subject. Definitely very important when it comes to climbing, climbing community, climbing performance is affected by being light. That's just the way it is, um, yeah. Where we will go from there, it's going to be interesting to see, yeah? Alright, I think I'm going to have an interesting, hopefully, uh, rest of the day. I hope you too stay strong and healthy and fit wherever you are. Keep crushing. I'll see you soon in the next one, guys. Bye.